Welcome to Prevention 101, a five-part series exploring the foundational principles of substance misuse prevention on college campuses. This series is brought to you by the Higher Education Center for Alcohol and Drug Misuse Prevention and Recovery through The Ohio State University. Module 3 features Dr. Bob Saltz of the Prevention Research Center through the Pacific Institute for Research and Evaluation, who will explore environmental strategies to reduce alcohol-related harm. Dr. Bob Saltz is a senior scientist at the Prevention Research Center, a unit of Pacific Institute for Research and Evaluation in Oakland, California. The center is one of the national research centers funded by the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. While his first project was a study of the social networks of people recovering from heroin addiction, Dr. Saltz's subsequent work has centered on ways in which drinking contexts may influence the risk of injury or death, with special emphasis on drinking in licensed commercial outlets and on college campuses. His research topics have included alcohol-impaired driving, responsible beverage service and retail businesses, and the design and implementation of comprehensive community prevention interventions to reduce alcohol-involved trauma. He has also published on non-medical use of prescription drugs and is currently developing and evaluating an online training for vendors of commercial cannabis products. He was the principal investigator of a multi-campus college prevention randomized trial funded by NIAAA and is currently directing another community-level randomized trial funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration aimed at reducing excessive drinking among youth and young adults. Among his professional activities, Dr. Saltz has served on several NIAAA, a National Institute of Drug Abuse, CDC, and National Institute of Health Review Committees, served as a board member for the Society for Prevention Research, and has served on several committees for the Research Society on Alcoholism. He also served on the Surgeon General's Workshop on Drunk Driving, as well as NIAAA's Task Force on College Drinking. Before we get started, I just want to remind everyone, if they needed it, uh, why we're talking about uh, prevention of college student drinking harms. And of course, the media tend to focus on the 1,800 deaths, mostly traffic crashes uh, among 18 to 24 year old college students. But if you just scan some of these other numbers, uh, I want to remind everyone that there are hundreds of thousands of injuries, uh, assaults, sexual assaults, and these things tend to be under the radar, so to speak, of the, of the media typically, but there are significant uh, harms um, that are a result of alcohol and on the campuses. And that last point is that 25% uh, of the college students report that their academic performance has been negatively impacted by their drinking. And that alone should be a cause of concern, much less all of the other injuries that are captured by these numbers. Um, this chart is uh, also important for us to understand. It shows that when we raised the minimum drinking age, we did have the intended effect especially on high school seniors, the 12th graders, uh, but even those who uh, left high school and are outside of school now but are not in college, they too seem to have moderated their drinking after the 21-year-old uh, drinking age, but much less effect was seen among full-time college students. And for some people, including Henry Wexler of the Harvard School of Public Health, uh, this was some time ago, he said, gee, the scope of the problem makes immediate results of any interventions highly unlikely. So I, I don't know that he would agree with this statement these days, but at the time it seemed very uh, pessimistic that uh, we could do anything. But yet, um, if we look at these data, uh, this shows uh, students who are 18 at wave one in still seniors in high school, and then over the next few years, it tra traced their drinking. And what's interesting here is that the college-bound students in the red, um, they uh, drank less, they were less likely to drink five or more drinks in a row when they were in high school. And yet merely one year later when they entered college, their drinking exceeds that of their peers who did not go to college. And then finally at wave four as they're about to graduate, both the college and non-college groups drink alike. And it seems like their risk of heavy drinking is the maximum during those college years. Some call this the college effect. And uh, what's important for prevention folks to see is that that means it's a clue that uh, something's going on during those college years and we could possibly moderate that environment in order to reduce the risks of harm among the college bound uh, population. I have to just point out that um, most recent data in this shows a less of a gap between these two groups. 
but it's still something to direct our attention. And that's why some uh, take up the public health model of uh, alcohol-related problems. And this is a model that's very obviously very simple and used for other epidemics besides, uh, say, drinking-related uh, harms. And it, what it says is that the level of harm, the level of the prevalence of any alcohol-related problems is due to the interaction of three different sources. One is the individual, and of course that's the one most people tend to focus on. Individual risk factors, uh, whether it be a family history of drinking, or uh, men drinking more than women, or some who have a history of early on, you know, early uh, use of alcohol. These all things contribute to the level of drinking problems. But then there's also the alcohol itself, and alcohol can have a, an effect dependent on the type of beverage, low alcohol beers versus full alcohol, distilled spirits and the way they're drunk, et cetera. That can factor in as well. And then we have this whole area called the environment. And this is not just the drinking context, let's say, like the difference between drinking in a bar or a restaurant or at home or at friends' houses, but it also covers broad uh, environmental factors such as the legal environment and those things that control the availability of alcohol, the economics uh, around the way alcohol is priced and sold and promoted, the physical environments uh, like the density of alcohol outlets in a, in a neighborhood or a city, and then even uh, the media, uh, mass media, uh, the promotion of alcohol, the normative environment, things that might control alcohol's use uh, through a climate of when it's appropriate or inappropriate. And some of these things seem a little uh, um, unusual to some people that haven't been looking at uh, prevention of alcohol problems, this idea of, of addressing the environment. But if you compare it to traffic safety, we're quite familiar with all those things that go on in the environment to reduce the risks of uh, traffic crashes. Of course, we do have individual level folk, uh, uh, interventions like driver training, driver education, and the like. We also ha have made our vehicles much safer with airbags and uh, controls and soon uh, autonomous driving, so I suppose. But if you look there at traffic laws and the roads and the intersections, we, we have a, a variety of ways uh, to make driving safer through controlled intersections, through the design of roadways, through the enforcement of traffic laws. And all of these are designed independent of the risks that individuals have, uh, individual risk factors. They're, they apply to the entire population with the idea, for instance, you have a dangerous intersection, a time and a place where cars are crashing, you can address that harm by looking at those places or times and changing that environment to lower the risk. And that's what we do when we uh, want to address alcohol-related problems with environmental interventions. Now, some of you may be familiar with the report that was put out by the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism some years ago now, the year 2002. And it was a report that said, let's look at the, the data and research that we have available to us now and uh, come up with recommendations based on that research about what could work in a college setting. And what they found, they divided into different tiers. Recommendations to both researchers and to academics was divided up saying, well, we have found evidence of effectiveness of, of certain prevention interventions, that so-called tier one recommendations, adopt these and it will improve uh, the situation in your campus. But the committee was very disappointed to find that there were only, uh, say, three of those, uh, including, for instance, the cognitive behavioral interventions or brief interventions that are uh, now pretty widespread among college campuses. But they were all tailored toward individual level uh, prevention. The, the task force then wanted to emphasize that there are this whole other group of environmental interventions that have been shown to be effective in general populations, but has just never been evaluated in a college campus or community environment. And they wanted to see more research done in that area because there was a great expectation that these would be effective as well in a college community. 
So then they had, uh, they wanted to acknowledge tier three, a lot of other ideas that had never been evaluated in any form and that somebody should come along and evaluate some of those uh, things as well, like keg registration, for instance, to restrict uh, the availability of, uh, of beer to underage drinkers. And then finally, they wanted to uh, reinforce the notion that uh, awareness campaigns alone uh, have never been shown to be effective. They can be part of a comprehensive program and an important part of those, but it's a mistake to believe that just merely uh, distributing knowledge, disseminating information by itself would have a desired effect. So the task force said there are a variety of environmental interventions, population level interventions that have been shown to be effective elsewhere and that should be evaluated, implemented and evaluated at the college level, including uh, significantly the increased enforcement of minimum drinking age laws since college students are typically below the legal age for drinking and the implementation of DUI laws which would help as well along with other things such as responsible beverage service. So uh, they also said well if you're going to attempt any of those interventions you probably need to form a campus and community coalition um, in order to successfully implement them so you can evaluate them. Well, some have said, gee, this sounds like a lot of work. Why would I bother with these interventions when I could just go with the tier one strategies and take those? Like, why can't we just do a cognitive behavioral intervention or, uh, you know, especially with students who have had problems that are mandated in some kind of way to attend those sessions? Uh, maybe brief interventions would work alone. But uh, the problem with adopting just those tier one strategies is that it, the alcohol-related problems are not limited to just the high-risk drinker. Some years ago, I did a survey of college students and just asked them to tick off one of a typical list of, say, uh, 20 problems that can be related to your own drinking. And they run from the you know, relatively common problems, such as hangover over there on the far right, and out to the left are the more severe and thankfully much less common problems such as being the victim of a sexual assault or being the uh, perpetrator of a sexual assault which are uh, reported with much less frequency. And we don't have to get into the details of this chart so much as to show that in any case of any problem you choose, the red bars represent the students who are frequent binge drinkers. In other words, they reported drinking five or more drinks more than once in the last two weeks. And what the chart shows is if all those students were to become abstainers, stop drinking, or maybe even transfer to another college, we would still have more than half of these problems being reported by the other students who were not frequent in uh, were not frequent binge drinkers, and the reason for that is that it's just the sheer numbers of the students who are light and moderate drinkers, who even though they're individually at lower risk, their sheer numbers mean that when you go to see who's reporting hangovers or at an emergency room for injuries, it turns out that most of them are light and moderate drinkers and not the heaviest drinkers because even their risk is low as an individual, but as a population, they contribute to most of the problems that we see on campuses. So again, we shouldn't limit our focus to the high-risk drinkers. There are other reasons not to just stick with tier one strategies. Some of these are difficult to implement with fidelity. They require trained, for instance, counselors for some of the, uh, the uh, cognitive behavioral interventions. Uh, they can be labor intensive and costly to implement for large populations and some individual level strategies might be compromised in what are, we might call as hostile environments. Um, there is some evidence to show, for instance, that Northern marketing campaigns are ineffective in camp with colleges or campuses that are surrounded by lots of alcohol outlets. This was work done by Bill DeYoung and his uh, colleagues some, a few years ago. Uh, and then there's opportunity, and thinking more positively, there's an opportunity to create synergy across the levels of intervention. So you can match or merge individual level strategies with population level strategies uh, to, and enhance the effect of both types of interventions. But there are challenges 
to adopting uh, environmental interventions. And the typical, uh, typical challenges include this assumption that we should only target high-risk drinkers. There's ambivalence about youth drinking. Plenty of people believe that it's really not that serious and not dangerous. There's the low perceived eff efficacy of preventive interventions. There are those who believe, well, students will just get their alcohol no matter what you do, and the heaviest drinkers will always drink heavily, and there will always be risks, and that prevention doesn't work. And there's just typical challenges of coordination and resource allocation. Where do you get the, the people or the resources to be able to carry out these interventions? And thankfully, this is less common now than it was maybe 10 or 20 years ago, but there's still the possible fears of a backlash, that if we do anything significant at a population level, we'll get some pushback uh, from students or even alumni who don't appreciate these efforts. Uh, and on a college campus, uh, there are even other things that can work against us, and some of those include the emphasis on process over outcome. So if you could put a coalition together, and in some cases, there's so much attention given to letting everybody speak and having everybody at the table that this can actually interfere with the objective of getting these interventions in place. College is also being institutions of higher learning. There's a, pre a preference for using persuasive methods like information campaigns over using um, legal controls mechanisms. And the fact that universities are complex and diffuse organizations means that people aren't sure who's in charge and who can actually carry through these interventions. It can be a problem, especially where uh, you know, frontline personnel feel that they are not authorized. And often those frontline per, uh, personnel are trained in education and awareness strategies, uh, health promotion types, um, and they may be, uh, uh, feel uncomfortable with some of these uh, environmental interventions. Uh, so let me just describe, since that task force came out, there have been a number of projects that have shown that there is, in fact, reason to be uh, optimistic about uh, these environmental interventions. I'm going to talk about one that I was definitely involved in, the Safer California Universities project. And we were trying to focus on reducing intoxication and the harm related to intoxication. Um, those were our targets. We recruited 14 large public universities in California. We randomly assigned them to intervention sites versus comparison sites. These included all the University of California campuses that had undergraduates, as well as six other California State University campuses that had residential populations, for instance. We tried to choose those that were uh, that resemble the UC campuses uh, in, in the size and in the residential uh, populations. And the interventions that we chose from the literature showing where the, those that had been effective in other populations, compliance checks, these are, to, these are checks with retailers to make sure they're not selling to underage people by putting in decoys that attempt to buy and citing liquor stores or restaurants that serve uh, minors. There's DUI checkpoints. The main point of these is that they're highly visible, lights circulating, you know, revolving, et cetera, uh, to remind the students that uh, drinking and driving is a serious offense. Um, there are party patrols. Now, these uh, are typical in college settings. These typically of uh, tend to focus on uh, catching minors in possession and citing those, but our approach was different. We wanted to cite the hosts of parties that were out of control with either very loud parties with drunken people um, and you know over the the safety margins for the size of the of the party goers, the number of people there. And we wanted to cite the host and not just simply the people who are underage. And what we're trying to do there is uh, change the behavior of party hosts. So either they decided not to host a party at all, or at least they would do it under controlled circumstances with much smaller parties. And this would, again, reduce the availability of uh, such parties or of the alcohol to people that were underage or to the entire student population for that matter. We also rec recommended, if possible, and what's in 
too much trouble to pass a social host response cost ordinance, which increased the fines if police had to break up parties at the same address, say, twice within uh, 180 days or something like that. Uh, this was just to enhance the discussion around the costs of hosting uh, parties, and about three out of our seven intervention sites did so. And finally, there was a, a social host safe party campaign, which really was to bring visibility to all the other elements of this intervention, so that students were more likely to have heard about all of the things that were going on. Um, and so this was an important piece of it, because our objective was not to catch students in any of these settings, but rather to deter the kind of behavior that uh, led to intoxication and to harms. So the strategies include focusing it at the settings, off-campus parties or bars and restaurants, focused at the beginning of the academic year so that we could set those expectations early on. We had highly specified planning and implementation process we shared with the uh, intervention sites, and we paid attention to getting these things in place uh, rather than on, for instance, bringing all the stake possible stakeholders around to the table. We also planned a mid-course correction, and this is the idea to fix any problems that might arise, and this was to help us overcome some of the reticence we might have found on any of the campuses. So the outcomes I'm going to show you are coming from annual surveys that were done that focused not just on overall consumption, but looked at uh, drinking at specific settings that we were targeting. We put together the two baseline years with two years post-intervention. And this was an example. This was the likelihood of getting drunk at an off-campus party. And the intervention sites are in green and the control sites in blue. And you can see good news, bad news here. We did reduce the likelihood of getting drunk at off-campus parties, but in both cases, those things were still increasing. We just slowed the increase at our intervention sites. Um, and if we get better results when looking at the likelihood of getting drunk the last time that they're at a bar or restaurant. Here, we actually reduce the likelihood of getting drunk, whereas at the comparison sites, it was increased. Uh, again, a historical trend. The practical significance of this is that at each campus, uh, this modest amount of uh, this modest amount of effect we got translated to 900 fewer students drinking to intoxication at off-campus parties and 600 fewer at bars and restaurants. But because students don't just go once a semester to these sites, if you multiply it out from our data, how often they went to these settings. It's the equivalent to 6,000 fewer incidents of intoxication at off-campus parties and 4,000 fewer incidents at bars and restaurants of students getting drunk each semester at each campus. So again, one of the advantages of these environmental population level interventions is that you can have a fairly sizable effect when it's applied over an entire population, even with sort of modest uh, rates of change. And I have to mention this, so many people think that if you focus in, say, on off-campus parties, the students will just go somewhere else to drink, and we were able to check that with the data in our surveys, and there was no displacement to other settings, you know, like parks, beaches, and the like, or to on-campus parties. Um, there was no change in that, so it was uh, a positive result, net uh, other settings. There were other studies I just want to make you aware of. One of the first after the task force report was uh, the Matter Degree AMOD program. They were able to show that campuses, heavy drinking campuses where implementation had been uh, completed, they were able to show reduction in these outcomes, binge drinking, DUI, and the like. Um, there was a study in Western Washington University uh, campus community strategy was very similar to what we did in the California cases. Uh, this included enforcement of party patrols and also some training, some uh, alternative programming at, late at night. And here, uh, just to show one set of outcomes, the likelihood of binge drinking in the last two weeks, we had two intervention campuses, Western Washington and Central Washington. They're exactly parallel and in decline compared to level at the comparison sites. So again, another positive outcome. And then there was a very uh, well-designed study by Mark Wilson and his colleagues in North Carolina involving 10 
uh, university campuses uh, randomly assigned to intervention control similar to the California setting. Here they focused on these environmental strategies, uh, reducing availability for instance or improving social norms, uh, using a community organizing model and they were able to show uh, uh, evidence of reducing um, uh, severe consequences of drinking on those intervention sites. You can see in the slide 228 fewer students experiencing one or more severe consequences in the past 30 days and 107 fewer causing alcohol related injuries to others in the way that they measured this in the past 12 mo months. And the authors are careful to say that this was you know modest results, significant at a public health level but it means that they should be accompanied by other interventions as well. So where are we going in the future? Well, we want to see replications of these studies. There's a handful of them. Even though they're you know, positive results, we need to be able to replicate them. We want to put them together in full comprehensive interventions, combining the individual with environmental, because we think we're going to get the synergistic effect when they're combined where there's, an, there's a, a very large need for translational research. We're still doing these implementations with you know, best practices and conventional wisdom about the best way to do these things, but we need more research to, that can you know, guide us uh, with empirical results on how to implement these kinds of interventions. And overall, we need ways to improve or prevent the management of these comprehensive prevention interventions because they're not simple to implement. So uh, I do want to end by just reminding people that since that task force report, there's been another initiative from uh, National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism to put together the so-called college AIM, the Alcohol Intervention Matrix, and it captures the evidence that's been generated since the task force on uh, individual level and environmental strategies to use in a comprehensive program for any college administrator to review. Uh, it's a very simple simple thing. It captures lots of aspects of these uh, choices between different interventions. And it's, it should be very helpful of those that are looking to put together a prevention program. So that's it. I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to uh, present environmental interventions.